What's up, guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of Chargers Weekly. And we haven't done one of these beat writer roundtables in a while. It's been about a month. So I got a six box here. Let's start with Haley Elwood, Chargers.com. Jeff Miller, Los Angeles Times. Daniel Popper, The Athletic. Jason Hirshhorn, Sports Illustrated. Joe Reedy, Associated Press. Ladies and gentlemen, happy Thursday. We're taping this on a Thursday. How you guys doing? I'm doing well. Is it a six box? Is that like a real thing? Is that a real phrase now that we use? I, I, I must have just it? coined it. I must have just coined it. I have. <laughs> see, hey, I don't know. I don't know how. Right there. Yeah, I don't know if you guys can. I don't know how you're viewing this, but I, I have it viewed as like a Hollywood Squares type mm -hmm. six box. Ah, nice. nice. Yeah, it very, would take us about three hours bunched. to get Jeff to that point. So let's just not even go there. Right? <laughs> First of all, Jeff. Missy, Miller. Jeff. Jeff Miller, big time to start the draft uh, with yeah, the right around table. We had a couple of them. We had a uh, – I think everybody here was pretty faithful to the, to the round table. Jeff had bigger plans. I had – well, I had to uh, take care of the people who write my paychecks. That's what yeah. I had to do. So. As, a, as a former newspaper man, I can relate. Deadlines are uh, a doozy. So yes. I give him a pass yes. on that one. Yeah, of, of course we joke because Jeff does great work. And you had, uh, you had deadlines. So that's the name of the game. That is the name of the game for me still. Some of us still are uh, beholden to a uh, certain time frame. So I'm sorry I missed. I would have loved to have let those talk about the draft. But uh, I'm sure you guys covered it well and uh, hit all yeah. the high spots. Well, I think we did. And it, like I said, it's been about a month since we've done this last. Uh, I guess, Haley, let's start with you. What have you learned about this team that maybe we didn't know a month ago talking about the draft and the schedule release. So, you know, what are maybe a few things that stuck out to you? Yeah, I think that's a really good question to start. I think um, just kind of how everyone's navigating the virtual meeting world. And I'm going to start personally with rookie mini camp because I actually got a chance to sit in on one of their meetings and just how that shifted from what we knew rookie mini camp to be to what it was in 2020. And it seemed to actually go really well. So guys basically had their normal football meetings that took the place of, you know, what they would be doing out on the field and, or supplementing, I guess. Um, and then they had player development sections. And one of the really cool things was for the player development parts to those meetings, they had special guests come in. So I think it was on Saturday, they had Tom Telesco talk, they had John Spanos talk, and they had some players talk as well. One of them being Austin Eckler, who I know we all heard from just this week, who spoke with the media. And I got a chance to talk to a couple of the undrafted rookies and one of them, Jeff Cotton out of Idaho wide receiver. He had said it was so great just hearing from Austin because that's a guy who's done it. He's done it before. You saw him get that contract. You saw him make the 53 as a rookie to where he is today. And just to kind of tap into that, I think that's so important because those guys, though, and those undrafted guys, pretty much any rookie as well, this is a whole new world that they're having to navigate and the odds may be stacked against them, but to give those guys maybe those tools and those resources is huge, especially just given this environment that we're all in right now. Yeah. Austin Witt. 30 minutes yeah. on the, uh, on yeah. the media call Chatty, too. Chatty Kathy. Yeah, Chatty Kathy there. Popper, what about you? I, I, I think it's the, the virtual meetings, obviously it's new for everybody, but in terms of the mental aspect of the game, I feel like you can really kind of lock in and concentrate with some of this stuff. Yeah. Well, first off with Austin, anyone who spent time in the Chargers locker room know that is very in character for him. Uh, he, he will talk at length about pretty much any topic and be very thoughtful. Um, the second thing, J J Jason, did you get a haircut? Uh, a, a self done haircut. It looks, it looks fantastic. I'm actually, impressed. well, thank you. It looks like you went to the barber. All right. Now to answer your question. Um, you know, I've been chatting with a lot of, of the draft picks, the rookies, and, and there is some frustration there. Like they, it is a challenging time for them, obviously, like it, when specifically talking about football, because you get drafted and usually that first weekend, I mean, it's like five, six days after you get drafted, you know, you're at the facility. You're meeting coaches. You're on the field. You're at rookie minicamp. You're playing football. I mean, that's what these guys want to do. It's, it's, it's a bit of a dream of theirs for, you know, 18 to 20 years, depending on how old these guys are, you know, 20 years. And, you know, they're not getting that opportunity to get on an NFL field. And so you have to find other ways to, to keep yourself locked in. Um, you know, I talked to KJ Hill earlier this week, and he's like, you know, it's basically like I'm making flashcards. Like I'm in, you know, biology class in sophomore year of high school. You know, <laughs> yeah. like that's what it is. That's what you have to do. You have to sit there like you're studying for a test and go through these plays. And like Austin said yesterday, like 
you have to be so on top of the mental part of it because when you do eventually get on the field, you better know this stuff backwards and forwards or else you're going to have no shot to make the team. Yeah, absolutely. Jason, what about you, buddy? Well, for starters, I'm surprised that Popper didn't make note of the beard I'm working on, trying to match <laughs> him in terms of how menacing I can be. But, I combed it this morning. Just <laughs> menacing. Being menacing. <laughs> menacing Daniel Popper. That's how I think of him, too. But in, in terms of the, these virtual meetings, we do focus on the rookies because it is such a big step for them to go from college. It doesn't matter where they went to college to the NFL. But we have to keep in mind, there's a lot of changes that are going on with the Chargers that affect absolutely everybody. And it would have helped so much for them to have real actual OTAs, time on the field to work on those things. The offense in particular, it is going to look so different from how it did any of the last three years or any point during the Anthony Lynn regime. And it really matters that they aren't getting these opportunities to work on the field. So it's not just someone like Justin Herbert, who spent virtually his entire college career working for Pistol. Tyra Taylor is going to have to learn some new things too because of how much they want to spend under center, how much more outside zone we expect them to use, and the moving pocket. We, we just heard a lot of the coaches talk about how that part of the offense in particular is going to change. And you have Shane Steichen going into his first full year as an offensive coordinator. It's a great time, if you could have had it, to be on the field with your players, teaching the new nuances, and they just aren't able to do that in the same way they normally would. Yeah. And just like this podcast has to adjust, like I have six people on here and, and I love when people interrupt each other and it, you know, you go back and forth. It's harder to do that because it's hard to talk over each other. So everything is different in, in our world. Joe, what, what have you noticed uh, about kind of how the Chargers are doing business the last month? I think the one advantage with this, maybe compared to 2011, which some of us do do remember in those days, is that at least you're able to do installs during these virtual meetings. Back in 2011, also, iPad playbooks did not did not exist at all. They were still cutting film and everything, and being on towers and hoping that they didn't blow off the towers and everything while uh, taping practices. So at least they are getting installs. Um, I think the odds of an undrafted guy making a roster Labor Day weekend is going to be long for most of every team. That's where the expanded practice squads, I think, come into benefit because maybe week two or week three, we start seeing those undrafted guys crack the roster due to injury and due to other guys not being affected. So I think the biggest news also for me was earlier in the week with Governor Newsom allowing pro sports to open in the state of California, because let's face it, there were a lot of people wondering after this stuff out of Los Angeles County a week or two ago, and everybody starting to get into the schedule, uh, looking between the lines like, oh, the Rams are going to go to Glendale, the Chargers are going to go to Vegas for the year and everything. So I think the fact that we could have a training camp in Costa Mesa, very likely without fans, but the fact that everybody's going to be in the state is a big deal and important. Jeff, you, you can go back even beyond the draft and the schedule because we haven't talked to you in a while. Uh, just your overall thoughts on how the last maybe month or six weeks have transpired for the Chargers. I think they've done – this team in particular has done remarkably well. I think they, in the draft they've done well in the, in the offseason. I think Tom Telesco has done a good job of rebuilding things. I, I don't think to, – to, to this point, uh, other than some of the uh, direct impact it's had on some of these young guys, which we've talked about here, uh, I think they've kind of kept things going the way that they uh, normally would have. And I think you know this week uh, the NFL allowing some teams to get back into their facilities – you know, and the Chargers are one of the teams that aren't doing that. And I think that kind of speaks to – they don't feel like they're missing out on a whole lot. I don't think um, – you know, I don't think Tom Telesco feels like this has been a really compromised offseason for him, roster building-wise. I think he's done pretty much what he probably would have wanted to do. And so uh, I, I think they've done a – I think they've navigated as well as anybody has. Now is when we're going to start to see, you know, 
things are going to get different now because this is when we'd be seeing a mini camp would be coming and we'd have everybody together. Uh, and so that's, that's not going to happen. And uh, you know, how, how teams go from here is what's going to determine, um, you know, the success that teams have this season. I think it's just going to be one of those seasons where the teams that come together faster are going to be the ones that are better off. And a lot of that stuff, as we know, is it's almost fate and by chance and stuff. So, um, but I think to, to this point, I, I, you know, the Chargers are, I think they, they have to be happy where they're at. And it's just, it's just a matter of where they go from here. I want to go back to something that, that Joe brought up because it's, it kind of resonated with me over the last couple of weeks. Coach Lynn talked about it. And then um, obviously Austin went at length about the fact that it's going to be very difficult for a lot of these undrafted free agents to make this football team. And really just not with the Chargers, but all around the NFL, when you don't have those reps during OTAs and minicamp, Austin spoke to the fact that he had to mess up in OTAs and in minicamp just to know what to expect in training camp. And for anybody who wants to take this, I, I think that was the biggest takeaway for me over the last couple of weeks is just how difficult it is to translate what you're learning onto the football field to not have the, the luxury of doing that for these next couple of months before training camp. It's going to be an uphill battle for a lot of these guys. And perhaps Austin Eckler's story would be quite different if he was going through this in 2020. Yeah, I'll jump in here. It's not just about the opportunity to learn from mistakes and kind of figure out what you need to do. Very importantly, it's about proving yourself to the coaching staff and to the front office. If you don't have those opportunities, it doesn't matter how well you come off in those meetings. If they don't believe you can do those things on the field, it's not ultimately going to matter. And we don't know what the training camp, when it does come, what it's going to look like. So if you're an undrafted free agent, you know, think of all the reps you would have in a normal offseason. It's not a very high amount. You can subtract that by significant degree right now, even in a best case scenario moving forward. And there's just not going to be a lot of opportunity. So yeah, as Joe mentioned, the opportunity for a UDFA to make any particular NFL roster is going to be lower than normally is when it's already pretty insubstantial. And it's going to be a situation where we don't know who the next Austin Eckler is. Obviously, if, if we did, that player would have been drafted. But there are those guys out there. And this may just be a year where those guys miss those opportunities. And maybe they make it up, you know, 2021 when things presumably are a little closer to normal. But those guys might just never get those opportunities again. It's really a huge question moving forward for all NFL teams. What's it's also hard, it's, yeah, Popper, I just want to make this one point before you jump in, because wh what I find interesting, too, is some of the guys that they have gotten as undrafted free agents had pro days occurred and, and how had this uh, draft evaluation process been a, a little more streamlined and been kind of the same as it's been in the past. Perhaps a guy like Joe Gaziano from Northwestern gets drafted in the sixth or seventh round. You know, it, there, there's a lot of guys that they got a couple guys from Notre Dame that who knows, you know, it's it's just going to be very interesting to see even the back half of the draft, sixth, seventh round guys, uh, how they mesh with some of these undrafted free agents who, if it was a, a regular offseason, may have been drafted. Yeah, and with with Austin specifically, like he wasn't really on NFL radars until he put up huge numbers at his pro day. He ran a four four three, and then all of a sudden, some NFL teams were like, "Oh, maybe this guy's worth bringing in, seeing what he can do." Um, you know, how many guys at small schools? didn't get to have their pro days and didn't get to put up the big numbers that put themselves on NFL radars and now not, aren't even on rosters. I mean, it's a, it's a snowball effect. You can go on and on about the ramifications, but just what I was going to say before is another thing to consider is, you know, typically during OTAs is that's the time when these guys get the opportunities to work with some of the actual starters, because that's the time when you have, you know, veterans taking time off, guys might not show up to certain days. It's a little more relaxed because it's voluntary. And on those days where maybe a couple of veterans are sitting out and one guy doesn't show up, all of a sudden there's reps there for these undrafted free agents. When you get to training camp, and especially at a time when there hasn't been any mini camp or anything, like there aren't going to be many opportunities for guys lower on the roster to get reps because the guys higher up on the depth chart are going to need those reps to get themselves ready and in football shape. Um, you know, so that's another, it's another missed opportunity. I mean, like I said before, you go down the list, it's a snowball effect and everything is sort of a knock against the chances of some of these guys making the NFL, NFL teams, which is just highly unfortunate because uh, they're some of the best stories in the NFL are these guys that come from nowhere, from small schools. And in Austin's case, you know, make the 53 man with one performance in a fourth preseason game and end up signing a, you know, $25 million contract three years later. It's, you know, it's, it's unfortunate for everyone, for us in the media and for football players too. 
I think for most teams, too, the past couple of years, the preseason has been a case for those undrafted guys to get a whole lot of playing time. I think for most teams this year, I think especially the Chargers, depending how many preseason games we have, the starters are going to see at least a quarter and a half to one half of game action because they haven't had that install time during OTAs in training camp. So, you know, that with game action and film, that that reduces things even further. So, it, like everybody has said, it is just a sm- snowball effect that really with these undrafted guys, I don't think we're going to see impacts until somewhat into the season on the practice squad and then the chances they get through injury and what they what they show through practice. I remember 2011, Andrew Hawkins signed with Cincinnati first weekend of training camp as an undrafted guy, and he didn't really get to make his impact for the season until he was called to the active roster for week four, week five. And I think for a lot of the teams, that's going to be the case this year. Really if, yeah, I, I was going to say, I mean, I think all of that are really, those are all really good points. But the one thing is that every team is in the same boat. Every team is dealing with this in their own way. Every team signed, whether it's, you know, four undrafted free agents to as many as, you know, 19, 20 as, as the Chargers did. And I think teams are, though, trying to figure out how to navigate through that, given the fact that they can't get these on these guys on the field. And one thing that Coach Lynn said a couple weeks ago that stuck out to me is they're testing them. They have like pop quizzes. They have football tests. You know, how much are you learning about the playbook and, and, and how much can you then sort of reciprocate that info? And I had asked him, I'm like, how can you tell though if like a rookie is engaged in, in what's being taught? And he said, they ask questions. You know, I look for them to ask questions. And so obviously, yes, these guys need to get on the field. That has to happen but it's impossible currently at this point. So I think it's interesting though, to hear how this team in general, and I'm sure others as well are handling them and giving these guys the tools to attempt to be successful. But a lot of it is falling on them. It's that personal accountability that if you took, you know, online classes in college, that was on you. You had to be the one to, you know, delegate when you were going to study, when you were going to work. And I think it's interesting though, that, that, you know, this coaching staff, Coach Lynn specifically cited, you know, I want them to ask questions because that tells me that they're absorbing and they're learning. And even if they challenge some of those questions, he said it forces the coaches to look at things from the player's perspective. And they like that ultimately. Jeff, the fact that this draft class that the Chargers have maybe has a little bit more seasoning than others. And I just go down the line, Justin Herbert, we don't know if he's going to see the field or not this year, but 42 starts uh, so he has a, a complete resume at college, and hopefully that learning curve speeds up for him. You go to Kenneth Murray, who a guy who's you know highly intelligent, who you know I think a lot of people expect can can pick things up relatively quickly. Joshua Kelly, uh, the running back position, we've seen uh, folks at the running back position and have early success in the league. And then guys like Aloy Gillen was a uh, a captain for Notre Dame. KJ Hill, you know. Uh, Haley talked to Chris Carter. He was thinking about coming out last year and he was at the senior bowl. So the, the fact that Joe Reed's another guy who's a senior, um, a, you know, probably the best kick returner in the country. The fact that you have these guys who have maybe a little bit more seasoning, maybe that speeds up the process for the chargers. Who knows? I, I think it could. Um, I, I think it, it, this time that they're missing is there's no question. It's significant. Uh, yeah. It's interesting to me. I, I saw something this past week. They were talking about the quarterbacks drafted this year, and there's there's some people out there who still think Herbert could be the starter week one, which I would find shocking for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is who knows how much he's going to even play and be in the system before then. Um, it's same thing like they have in Miami with Tua. I mean, Tua has got the injury situation, but on top of that is, you know, the you know, the longer this goes, the less likely these guys are that are going to are going to play any kind of significant uh, amount of time. Uh, at least the quarterback position. It's interesting with the the guys you mentioned with the Chargers. I think there's there's something to that. But a guy like say like Joe Reed, who you know they I think they envision using a lot of different ways. That might take a while. He's gonna he's got to get you know he's gonna have to get acclimated to the speed of the NFL. He's gonna have to get ingrained in, in the into the system what he needs to do if he's going to be doing playing all these different positions and like joe said that's a situation where 
we might not see what Joe Reed is going to be until later in the season or maybe not even his rookie year, just depending on how much he, he's able to absorb and get in um, and get into the system and, and kind of develop. It's, I think other guys like Murray, I think he, you know, he's seems to be a really uh, dynamic athlete. I think a player like that probably and can uh, maybe adjust a little quicker and can kind of rely on his uh, physical skills and can kind of carry him a little more. Uh, than some of these other positions, maybe the skill position guys who maybe it's a little more of a mental game and trying to trying to figure out uh, how to how to work against an NFL defense. Uh, it, it's going to be tough for some of these, a lot of these guys. And I, I think most rookies this year are going to have their everybody knows it. And it's just part of it. It's just the reality. Uh, every team's in the same boat, but they're they're all going to be a little bit behind. And, and it's just a matter of how, how quickly they can catch up. Hey, I want to go around the horn here. Popper, we'll start with you. A little fun exercise. Which free agent that the Chargers have brought in do you think is going to have the biggest impact? And which rookie that was selected in the 2020 draft do you think will have the biggest impact this upcoming season? Just one, one guy from the free agent class, one guy from the rookie class. All right. Uh, rookie class, I think it'll be um, Kenneth Murray. Um, I see him slotting in right away as the starting will linebacker. Um, they, they love what he brings in terms of his well, athleticism. I don't, think Jeff, his, I don't think Jeff liked your answer. He oh, just he got okay. up and left. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. We had a we had a uh, had a cat situation. I had to take care. Of. Um, <laughs> Go so ahead. much disrespect, Jeff. Are you ready? Can I continue? You need please, to be here for my continue. takes. Um, yeah, I think he's going to play the most snaps of any rookie. Um, and you know, they love what he brings as far as, you know, finally having a sideline to sideline run and hit linebacker. Um, you know, he's, he's the real deal and he's going to get an opportunity to play early. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, how, how good are his coverage skills and, you know, can they bring him along in that department? Um, you know, as far as free agent signings, I'm split between Harris and Bulaga, but I think I'm going to go with Bulaga just because, the offensive line was such a disaster last season that actually having a sturdy tackle, regardless if it's right or left, is going to be a huge added bonus for this offense. And I think we'll see the ramifications of that pretty much immediately. Um, so I'll go with Belaga as free agent and uh, Kenneth Murray as the rookie. Jason, what about you? Those were going to be my exact answers. Oh, just yeah, because of, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. No, because just because of what Balaga <laughs> means to any offensive line that needs a starting offensive tackle, which the Chargers did, and specifically to the Chargers because of James Campin coming in as the offensive line coach, that's going to ease that transition. Uh, if, I, if I'm going to choose other options, just so this isn't you know us saying, yeah, I was going to do, do that too, uh, I, I would say in terms of the rookies, Joe Reed, because of what he can do on special teams, and not even just as a returner, they might be able to use him other ways as a gunner. And we know they lost so much talent on special teams from a year ago. That's going to make a difference. And if he becomes even a, a semi-regular contributor to the offense, that could be a huge role for a guy that was drafted on the third day. Usually do not see that as a rookie. Uh, in terms of the other free, age, uh, free agent acquisitions, I'm actually going to go Linval Joseph because of all of the nose tackles that they saw walk in free agency this year, and, and with Brandon Mee by, uh, being, excuse me, Brandon Mee being, being released, Linval Joseph isn't just going to be the new starter. He's going to be the true anchor of that defensive line. We know how much that matters in Gus Bradley's game. Yeah, plus, plus a leader uh, across that line. You, you lose some voices in the room. Mee Bain was a big voice. Linval can, can fill that void as well. Haley, what about you? Yeah, I was going to go with the popper special right there with uh, with <laughs> Kenneth Murray and Brian Balaga. I think Kenneth Murray, look, this is a guy they traded the popper up for. special. popper special. It's a guy they traded up for. And I remember Tom telling me, Tom Telesco telling me they were so impressed with his combine interview and that so sold them just on, on him. And it was one of those that was so memorable. And we saw what he was able to do on the field. I agree. I think he could make a definite immediate impact. And then Brian Balaga, specifically to Jason's point about James Campen, Telesco said it was a focal point of this team to sort of rebuild that offensive line and tweak it and, and basically not really totally make it over, but kind of. And so bringing Campen in was huge. And then bringing in a guy like Brian Balaga on that right side who has that relationship with him. Look, we know that, you know, there's Pouncey and there's Dan Fe Feeney, excuse me, and there are other guys who have been on this team and on this line. But to have that sort of just immediate relationship between coach and player and how that can extend out, I think that'll be super helpful for that unit overall. Good answers. Joe Reedy, uh, what, what are you going to do? <laughs> okay, the non Kenneth Murray division, as far as uh, <laughs> top rookies, <laughs> I'm going to get. 
I'm going to go with Joshua Kelly. Yeah, um, that's a good answer. Justin Jackson, we d- we don't know what he can do, and he's been injury plagued. Well, we know what he can do. He just he he's got to stay on the field because we he's yeah. he's shown in a in in flashes. I mean, in that Pittsburgh game at the beginning of yeah, the year. I was going to say the Pittsburgh game for sure. Yeah, he had me in he had me in Pittsburgh, but you're but you're right, yeah. Joe. He's got to stay on the field. Yeah, you can't stay with the club in the tub. Um, so yeah, yep. There's, there's that thing. And just after covering Josh in two years at UCLA, seeing what he can do, the between-the-tackles type runner, the tough yards, I think we're going to see a little bit more of how he can catch the ball out of the backfield, something we didn't see with Chip's scheme and everything. Uh, as far as free agent signings, whoever they sign at left tackle – <laughs> over the next <laughs> one is, is a possibility. Huh. But also, as far as – I mean, it, it, as far as guys that I think you should not sleep on as far as free agent signings in that position group, do not sleep on Nick Vigil with the versatility that he has at outside and as a middle linebacker. And that linebacking group – it still doesn't have a lot of depth to me. But if you can do the three starters with Murray, uh, Drew Tranquil, and possibly Vigil starting there too, I think that makes that position group better. I think it it doesn't put as much pressure on the defensive line and the secondary. And I think as far as the speed that they can have, helping out on quarterbacks and coverage really helps that defense out big time. All right. Jeff Miller. Uh, rookie wise. I mean, this, uh, Lohi Gilman is, is intriguing to me. Just these guys have had success with, uh, taking players out of Notre Dame. Uh, he kind of almost seems like a, the safety version of uh, Drew Tranquil from last year, right? He kind of has that, that playmaking special teams kind of, uh, seems to have that kind of on his resume. So I think he's a guy who we could see, kind of emerge on special teams like Tranquil did last season, and especially with having what's going to be this sort of shortened, uh, you know, off-season program, training camp, whatever it ends up being, he's probably going to be more of a special teams player. So that's a guy who I would look to. And now watch my my veteran savvy here. On the other side, we're going to bring it all together, folks. This is how you do this. Chris Harris Jr., who undrafted free agent, going back to our conversation earlier, talk about a guy who, who took advantage of being undrafted back a few years ago in Denver emerged to become one of the best slot corners ever basically in the NFL and I think a guy like that if you look at you know the free agents they brought in I'm excited to see him play he by all accounts is you know we've seen him a little bit just you know when they played the Chargers the last couple of seasons for me at least and uh, you know everybody raves about him they rave about what a good guy he is all the great work he does in the community you know, he's won kind of awards for you know everything from his citizenship to his courage and all this stuff. And I think he's going to be a great addition to the locker room. I'm looking forward to having a chance to, to talk to him on, on when, in open locker room situations. I think we all are. And he's a veteran voice. And he's a guy who still can play at a pretty high level, I think. So I'm going to you know, it'll be interesting to see him and join that uh, secondary room. And I mean, that's a that's a very deep group and a a group that I, I think the Chargers are, are really excited about should be. And I, I think it, it, they have a chance to be among the best in the NFL on the back end, no question. What I love about the Chris Harris Jr. pick, Jeff, is uh, the Chargers were at the bottom of the league in, in taking the ball away last year. So if you have a healthy Derwin James next to Chris Harris Jr., who former All-Pro quarter, I know he's a little bit older, but um, and then you couple that with, with Bosa and Ingram, if they can take the football away – uh, having a guy like Chris Harris Jr., I, I believe, is a luxury when you have a pass rush that the Chargers have. It's just a matter of staying healthy. And from rookie perspective, I think I think Kenneth Murray and Joshua Kelly are probably the the, the two options you look at. And I, I I agree with with you, Joe. I think Joshua has a real shot to take some of those carries that were meant for Melvin Gordon. Um, uh, to take those and kind of run with it, because when you put Austin Eckler all over the field. Um, you know, Joshua can really complement that. And then I, I do believe in, in Justin Jackson. It's just a matter of him staying healthy this year because he didn't miss a start at Northwestern. So uh, hopefully it's just kind of tough luck for, 
for Justin. Um, guys, final thing, we, we do our little parting shots. Um, let's just go back around, but we'll start with Jeff Miller, unless there's a cat situation that you need to take care of. Uh, no, cat, cat's fine. She's just, she's in here now and she's quiet. She's settled down. So we're good. <laughs> All right. Take us home, Jeff, your, your parting shot before we do this again. And I don't know when we're going to do this again. This we're kind of slowing down here before camp. Um, so what's the topic? Anything we want? It's a, it's a, it's a free pass. A free pass. Yeah. Wow. What, now, whatever so you want to do, whatever you want to talk about, because you missed, you missed the schedule. You missed the, I did the, miss the, the schedule. uniforms. We, you know, you were, you were, you had lots of questions, <laughs> about, <laughs> questions about the uniform. Chris so I actually like very, very subtly insulted by your lack of appearance. What, on this what, podcast, well, what, so wait a second. Was there, was there a round table about the uniforms? Cause I, did, I didn't even know there was one. Did I miss that one? We, too? we, we kind of put it all together that same week of the draft. Um, we I just, I just put it all I, together behind my back. It sounds like right no, it was, it was as, <laughs> as part of the draft. We're all getting contact in the same Twitter DM. Thread, okay, like <laughs> you're never, you're never left out, Jeff Miller. Uh, basically, I'm pushing you towards your parting shot. I want you to talk about okay. the uniforms. Okay. No, my, actually, <laughs> yeah. my parting shot. I love this. I, I, I love this. Uh, you know, it, it's come up a little bit here this week about um, the last week or so about the Chargers and Rams and how. They, they may not uh, get along necessarily, uh, you know, just, you know, they're, they're business partners. So there could be some friction there. Like, I think there, there is, I love how uh, the chargers and that, um, that logo that the Rams have that everyone loves so much. I love that the chargers are among the teams that like trot that thing out. And like, <laughs> I, I think that team should, it's, it's just an awesome it's it's just an awesome subtle way for the chargers to get a dig on the rams and i think this the uniforms the chargers won that so convincingly over every the rest of the nfl the buccaneers were 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 second it sounds like but i think the uniforms are great i think the chargers have had a great off season in in terms of the uh the the logo and the uniforms and all that stuff on, on top of everything else we've talked about all right i love it thank you jeff <laughs> joe There's, reedy Okay, number one, props to the uh, Chargers uh, social media crew. They like being irrelevant and kind of the uh, irreverent, not irrelevant, irreverent. And, uh, <laughs> they don't like very being irrelevant. Words. Yeah, very different they're, words. They're, they're <laughs> not <laughs> irrelevant. They're irreverent and, uh, and uh, kind of uh, sticking it to different, different people, even with the uniform announcement. It, it, like, here's a process. It's like, oh, no, they look good. However... I have to do a version of come on, man, is my parting <laughs> shot. Oh, no. We had interviews last week, um, one of them being Drew Tranquil. And there is a certain person on this panel who would ask at least three or four Drew Tranquil questions a week. In fact, I don't even know if the people on the Notre Dame, so, on the Notre Dame beat asked for Drew Tranquil questions a week among coaches and everything so we get drew tranquil and who isn't on the call <laughs> or ask are you, questions are you taking shots at me? the person who asked the most <laughs> drew tranquil questions of everyone so no, daniel okay, popper wait, let me come myself. on man virtual shots virtual I, shots let me defend myself first off I was asking Drew Tranquil questions to Anthony Lynn because it was relevant because he was taking snaps away from Denzel Perryman. So I'm defending those questions. Second off, I'm working on other stories. I had another interview to get to. That, uh, so I left Drew Tranquil and I went and uh, interviewed Joshua Kelly. And if you read me, you know that I put out a feature on him uh, <laughs> last week about how he uh, you know, called Deshaun Foster every single day for months on end to get his spot at UCLA. And it was a good story. So I don't regret the decision. <laughs> this is this is why we leave the party shots wide open. You can talk about anything. Oh. <laughs> Haley Elwood. Oh, um, I I don't even know where to go after all of that. I'll be just, honest. Just find a way to to, to dig me. It's fine. Just, <laughs> no. Call too my too beard nice. menacing. Call me out for not asking Drew Tranquil a question. Questions, I'm, here. Yeah. I'm, the, it's just, I'm the punching bag. All shots taken, lead to Popper. Well, many of us thought Popper. that Popper was the president of the Drew Tranquil fan club. There you so. go. <laughs> Did he not play well last season? Like, Haley, before, before, before you start, it was, it was the best rookie of anyone in what, let's face it, was as before, far as – 
production of rookies was not a very good, well-producing rookie class. But yeah. like I said, even when Drew Tranquil was a star at Notre Dame junior and senior year, I don't know if the, the Drew Tranquil questions average five <laughs> or six like you asked last year. Hey, before I'm on the hype train, I'm on the hype train, baby. Uh, Daniel Jeremiah, I, I talked to him this week, and he said no one in the country is talking about Drew Tranquil, and he's going to show people what he's all about this year. So the fact that Daniel Popper's president of the fan club, he got in early, and I think he may be laughing at everybody once they – Okay, he's not it's president of the fan club, just just good at uh, accurately depicting, like, how good players are. Like, that's – I'm just, like, I'm, like, <laughs> good, like, doing my job well. Like, sorry. This is so, this is so off the rails. <laughs> really go ahead. So off the rails. Um, I'll, I'll just kind of tie it, tie it up with a, with a bow here and just try to say, look, we've been in this stay at home pattern for over 60 going on 70 days. And I think, um, I forget who brought it up, but someone brought up, you know, obviously mini camps would be happening mid next month. And I just think it's going to be interesting. I think every time we have these calls, I think I always end it with like, what happens from here? Where do we go from here? But, but truly like, where do we go from here? Because we know that states are opening up, but yet the NFL is trying to keep a level playing field literally in terms of, you know, keeping coaches and players at bay for the time being until maybe those facilities are able to open and and function safely. But I just think it's going to be interesting. You know, will we see players get on the field at some point next month, or is it going to be a camp situation or, or just kind of just the overarching questions of what happened moving forward because there are still a lot of questions to be answered and ultimately a lot of decisions that will affect what happens for this season as well. Well said. Jason. I'm going to build off of Haley's point a little bit. I think there's a big disparity between how the NFL and probably more specifically the NFL players see the season unfolding in terms of whether it'll be fans in the stands, the kind of interaction they're going to have relative to normal and what the fans themselves think. When the Chargers release their preseason schedule earlier this week. My mentions were filled with people excited about the opportunity to go to SoFi Stadium for the first time. And maybe SoFi Stadium will be open to fans in the preseason. I don't know that that isn't going to be true. Nobody knows at this point. But the fans are anticipating that it's going to be pretty close to normal. And that just does not seem to be the case from the eyes of the players, the people that we speak to in the NFL. Nobody at this point really knows. So There's going to be a reckoning between the reality of what has to happen because of the pandemic and what fans expect at some point this offseason, and it may not be pretty for those fans. Daniel Popper, you get the last word, buddy. All right. I'm going to keep this focused on the Chargers (laughs) instead of on the Chargers media to benefit (laughs) the people listening that want Chargers info. But so – you know, like, I, I feel like at the end of the day, the team that takes advantage of the situation the best is going to come out on top and have the best shot to win a Super Bowl. And that's, and this is tapping into something Haley was talking about earlier. Like, that's the way the Chargers are approaching this. That's the way Tom Telesco is approaching this. That's the way Anthony Lynn is approaching this. Like, everyone's in the same boat right now. So whoever does this virtual off season the best is going to come out with a pretty distinct, distinct advantage. Whoever is able to implement their offense and do their installs and get their rookies along fast enough and potentially have an undrafted free agent contribute. This is really important right now. And it's an opportunity to get a leg up over other teams. And I think the chargers are approaching it correctly. And whichever team is able to gain that advantage during this time and do this whole thing the best way possible um, is going to have the best shot to win the Super Bowl next year. Guys, I, I genuinely love doing this. And it's, again, I mentioned this during the, the round table. It's, it's hard to do it with six people virtually because you can't have the, the natural, like go back and forth and, and actually have a conversation. So I, I can't wait for the day that we can do this in person and everybody on this call that joins me does incredible work. Jeff Miller, read him at the LA times, Joe Reedy, AP, Jason Hershorn, sports illustrated, Daniel Popper doing a lot of big rookie things on the athletic right now. And, and Drew Tranquil Elwood, hype pieces. And yeah, and Drew Tranquil hype pieces. <laughs> and, uh, and, of course, Haley Elwood at Chargers.com. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we'll, we'll do this again before camp. Um, and uh, in the meantime, read and listen and watch all these people on this roundtable. Thanks, guys, for joining us.